Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to teach you how to get a patient started on parenteral nutrition. By the end of the video, you should be able to initiate parenteral nutrition in the acute care setting and establish a monitoring system to prevent or detect metabolic complications. If you find this information useful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. If you are looking for basic guidelines for using parenteral nutrition, or want to know how to do the macronutrient calculations, you can check out my videos on those topics here. This lesson is for when you have a patient who is a good candidate for parenteral nutrition, the fluid and macronutrient calculations have been completed, and you are preparing to begin the infusion. Prior to starting any patient on parenteral nutrition, there are a few precautions that should be taken. I have put them on a checklist for you. The checklist is there to make sure you confirm the infusion site, start the infusion with no more than 200 grams of dextrose, obtain a capillary blood glucose concentration, obtain a basic metabolic panel with magnesium and phosphate, obtain liver function tests, obtain serum triglycerides, and obtain a body weight measurement. These tasks can be completed in any order. The first item on the list is to confirm the infusion site. This topic is discussed in more detail in my video on peripheral versus central parenteral nutrition. Here, I just want to emphasize that you absolutely need to know that the patient has the appropriate venous access for the formulation you have prepared. If the parenteral nutrition has been prepared for a central venous catheter with an osmolarity greater than 900 milliosmoles per liter, and you try to run it through a peripheral vein, you will exceed the osmolarity that vein can tolerate. This significantly increases the risk for complications like phlebitis and loss of IV access. You can safely run a formulation that has been designed for peripheral access through a central catheter if needed. The second item on the list is to start the infusion with no more than 200 grams of dextrose in it. This is done to minimize the risk for hyperglycemia, which is the most common metabolic complication associated with parenteral nutrition. Obviously, this can occur in patients with diabetes. However, it can also occur in patients without diabetes due to metabolic stress, infection, or overfeeding, especially in the context of excessive carbohydrate intake. Most patients can begin with anywhere from 150 to 200 grams of dextrose per day, and then be advanced by approximately 25 to 50 grams per day, as long as the patient does not develop hyperglycemia in the process. It usually looks something like this. First, you establish a goal for dextrose like 250 grams per day. Then you start the infusion at 150 grams per day. Advance by 50 grams to 200 on day 2. And then advance by 50 grams again to 250 on day 3. It is always a good idea to do your initial calculations for the goal amount of grams of dextrose. This way, once the infusion is started, you know where you want to end up and can come up with a strategy for getting there. As an aside, if a patient has a low body weight and the goal dextrose load is 200 grams per day or less, you should start lower than 150 to 200 grams. In this situation, you can provide approximately 100 grams. This also applies if the patient already has poor blood glucose control. Recommendations for the use of insulin with parenteral nutrition is beyond the scope of this video. However, it will obviously play a role in the management of a patient with persistent hyperglycemia. This brings us to the third item on our list. Obtain a capillary blood glucose concentration. This should be done using point-of-care testing for glucose, or POCT glucose which is sometimes referred to as a finger stick measurement. 
The recommended POCT glucose for hospitalized patients receiving parenteral nutrition is 140 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. If the baseline concentration is above 200, then it should be corrected with insulin prior to the start of the infusion. Once parenteral nutrition is being administered, the dextrose load should only be increased toward the goal when the patient's blood glucose concentrations are within the desired range. POCT glucose should be obtained every 6 hours until the patient is at the goal dextrose load. Then it can be adjusted to meet the demand of the individual. For example, if the patient has blood sugar that has been difficult to control and is on insulin, you may want to keep the frequency every 6 hours or an even higher frequency of every 3 or 4 hours. However, if the patient does not have diabetes and has not had hyperglycemia at any stage of the admission, you may want to consider reducing the frequency to one time per day or less. The next items on the checklist include obtaining a basic metabolic panel and obtaining magnesium and phosphate measurements. The basic metabolic panel, or BMP, gives you values for sodium, potassium, and calcium. So this is where you can gain an understanding of how the patient's electrolytes need to be managed. If any electrolytes, especially potassium, phosphate, or magnesium, are low, they should be corrected with IV fluids before parenteral nutrition is administered. This is done to minimize the risk for refeeding syndrome, which is a condition that is characterized by a shift of those electrolytes into the cells when nutrition support is initiated. Patients who are severely malnourished are at particularly high risk for this complication. If electrolytes are already low when parenteral nutrition is started, there is a chance they will drop even lower to life-threatening levels. Since risk for this complication can last for at least 5 days after nutrition support is started, a daily BMP with magnesium and phosphate should be obtained until electrolytes are stable and it is clear that the risk for refeeding syndrome has subsided. The sixth item on the checklist is to obtain baseline liver function tests, or LFTs. Use of parenteral nutrition can contribute to liver dysfunction, So monitoring compounds like bilirubin and the liver enzymes alanine transaminase, or ALT, and aspartate transaminase, or AST, is necessary. A direct bilirubin that is greater than or equal to 2 indicates that the excretion of trace minerals like copper and manganese through bile is impaired. So the amount in parenteral nutrition is often reduced or eliminated to avoid toxicity and further strain on the system. An increase in the enzymes ALT and AST in the first week or two of an infusion may be transient, and values sometimes fall back within normal range with no changes to the formulation. However, When ALT and AST remain persistently elevated or continue to climb, it suggests there is fat accumulation in the liver. Possible nutrition-related causes of this include overfeeding, excessive provision of carbohydrate, the use of a soybean-based lipid emulsion, or the use of a continuous parenteral infusion. As such, There are various adjustments that can be made to avoid further complications, which will be covered in detail in a future video. For now, it is enough to know that you should obtain LFTs prior to administration, and that LFTs should then be monitored weekly while the patient is on parenteral nutrition in the acute care setting. That brings us to the seventh item on the checklist, obtain serum triglycerides. This one is particularly important for patients who have a known history of hyperlipidemia, as they are considered to be at an increased risk for developing hypertriglyceridemia. This complication can occur from excessive carbohydrate intake or from the intravenous fat emulsion. The current recommendation from Aspen is that when patients have a serum concentration greater than 400 mg per deciliter, the intravenous fat emulsion should be reduced or removed. 
For reduction, aiming for less than 30% of total calories from fat or less than 1 gram per kilogram per day is advised. A major concern with hypertriglyceridemia is that it can result in pancreatitis, although this is rare unless triglycerides are greater than 1,000. After obtaining a baseline measurement, follow-up measurement can be based on concern for individual risk. At the institution where I practice, we bundle triglycerides with the LFTs and obtain them weekly for all patients. The final item on the checklist is to obtain a body weight measurement. This will be important to establish a starting point by which you can compare future weights. Changes in body weight can provide valuable insight into the appropriateness of the energy and fluid load provided. For example, if you start a patient at 25 calories per kilogram per day and they lose several pounds over the first week of treatment, it may be an early sign that you are underfeeding them. Or, if you start a patient at a conservative 20 calories per kilogram per day and they start to gain weight quickly, it may be a sign that the patient is receiving an excessive amount of fluid. Body weight should be recorded daily in the first few days of an infusion. Once a patient is stable at the goal energy load, frequency can be reduced to 1-2 to two times per week. Now that the checklist is completed, the necessary adjustments can be made before parenteral nutrition is administered. I have added the recommended monitoring next to it so you can follow the patient closely and make sure your intervention is both safe and effective. Here is a summary for this lesson. Once you have found a candidate for parenteral nutrition, completed the fluid and macronutrient calculations, and are preparing to begin the infusion, there are a number of precautions that should be taken. These tasks can be completed in any order. One thing you'll need to do is confirm the infusion site as central or peripheral venous access to make sure the formulation you have made is safe to use. You'll also want to start with no more than 200 grams of dextrose per day. This is done to minimize the risk for hyperglycemia, which is the most common metabolic complication of parenteral nutrition. In most cases, you can start with anywhere from 150 to 200 grams, and then increase by 25 to 50 grams per day until the goal amount is reached. In addition to this, you'll need to obtain a capillary blood glucose measurement, which is often called a POCT glucose or finger stick. The goal here is to have a value between 140 and 180 milligrams per deciliter. If the baseline value is greater than 200, then it should be corrected with insulin prior to starting the infusion. Other labs you'll want to check are the Basic Metabolic Panel, or BMP, which contains the electrolytes sodium, potassium, and calcium. You'll also want to check magnesium and phosphate, which are not part of the BMP, but are equally important. If any of these are low, you should correct them using IV fluids. The purpose here is to minimize risk for refeeding syndrome. The last two laboratory measurements that should be obtained prior to starting parenteral nutrition are liver function tests, or LFTs, and serum triglycerides. A direct bilirubin of 2 or higher indicates that the liver is having difficulty clearing bile. So, to avoid toxicities, some clinicians will remove trace elements like copper and manganese. An elevated ALT and or AST suggests there is fat accumulation in the liver and so the parenteral nutrition order should be reassessed with possible adjustments made to the total energy load, the carbohydrate load, the type of lipid used, or the number of hours the infusion lasts each day. If the serum triglycerides are greater than 400, then the lipid emulsion should be reduced or removed. 
Finally, you'll want to obtain a new body weight measurement. This will be helpful to determine if the appropriate energy and or fluid load is being provided once the infusion is started. For example, if the patient's body weight gradually decreases over the first week, it is possible they are at risk for underfeeding. Another example is if the weight rapidly climbs in the first few days. In this case, changes are less likely to be from fat or muscle tissue and more likely to be from fluid shifts from excessive fluid intake. Once all of these tasks are completed and parenteral nutrition has started, you can implement a plan for monitoring. Current standards are to check POCT glucose every 6 hours until stable between 140 and 180 mg per deciliter, obtain a daily BMP with magnesium and phosphate until the labs are stable, obtain weekly LFTs and triglycerides, and obtain a daily body weight to start, then reduce the frequency to 1-2 to two times per week. By doing all of these things, you put yourself in the best position to give excellent nutrition care. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.